What is the difference the forgiveness of sin makes? In the life of the Christian, it's the difference between what must I do versus, Lord, what would you have me do? Not what must I do, but, Lord, what would you have me do? Because without the sense of forgiveness, the breathing room that it offers, the peace that it imparts, uh, it was Kierkegaard who actually said, with forgiveness of sin, you can look on your past and not know how wrong you have done and how much you have done, but instead how deeply you have been forgiven. There's great rest in it. Without that rest, I'm caught up in the fear of letting other people down, in the fear of not measuring up to my own expectations, or even the expectations of God. And as a result, what's built into me, if that's, those are my drivers, is a kind of fearful freneticism. So much, so much, so much. And Paul, all of us have days like that. The truth of the matter is, is that if that's actually the characteristic of our emotional makeup, is to fearfully live under an increasing level of obligations, the heart of the matter is not false expectations. The heart of the matter is that my heart does not know that I'm at rest with God, and that I'm His, that He is mine. And out of that, I'm free to serve, which is very different from being pulled by all of my own inner obligations, as well as the obligations of those around me which are taskmasters with whips to keep me in line, to do the thing that I must do. It's a terrible way to live. And there are plenty of Christians who you would think would know better, who live precisely like that. It doesn't mean that we don't live with perseverance. There is a difference, though. Perseverance is, in fact, calling. It's a part of the responsibility that we have been given actually by God to do well and to press in. Jesus definitely does not condemn perseverance. Just the opposite, when the four, when the five friends are bringing the man in to be healed, and of course Mark adds that, well, how they got in wasn't through the front door. What he says to them is, this is translated, take heart. It literally means be courageous. Keep at it. This is worth it. But we understand that if our sins are forgiven and we're called to perseverance, which can really be hard at times, we know that we're there by divine appointment. We know that God's work is in it, that he will give us the provisions that we need to be able to press in, even into the most difficult places. Because more often than not, just like the story of the five friends, that which we persevere into has everything to do with service and ministry to other people. It has to do with going the extra mile for their sake, which is why Jesus doesn't condemn the five friends. He actually says, be courageous, keep at it. And then of course says to the man, your sins are forgiven before anything else, making the point that which is easier or harder, forgiveness of sins or healing? Forgiveness of sin is much harder. Healing by comparison is easy. And so that's why he says, and so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin, take up your bed and walk. And of course the man immediately does. And he goes home. And we don't know what the man faced when he went home. I don't know whether it was an easy lot or a difficult one. Just because even you were miraculously healed doesn't guarantee you a better future, at least in terms of your circumstances. What I think about in terms of all of this is that I never ever can lose sight or should not lose sight of the fact that the center of gravity for us is really not the work. The center of gravity is life with God. The center of gravity is being in His presence. The center of gravity 
is learning in prayer how to persevere on behalf of other people or in a situation that has a kind of knot in the center of it and we don't know how to get it undone. It's not by trying harder. It's instead by being available so that somehow I can begin to see these circumstances from God's perspective, which is he sees exactly what he's trying to teach all of those who are available in the story. He's, he, this isn't a private transaction between he and the man who is carried in on a cot. Instead, what's going on, it's a teaching moment that declares the centrality of the forgiveness of sins and the uniqueness of Jesus in his capacity to be able to do this. So that you may know that the, th the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. It's, in that sense, an evangelical moment. But for us who say, yes, I've trusted in you and I believe you for the forgiveness of sin, it, it, I'm reminded in the story that this isn't just these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life, as in going to heaven. But then instead, the forgiveness of sins is the lens through which we look at life, ourselves, our circumstances, even other people. Without it, all we have is fear, obligation, the need to get even, often we because there's no one who will take up our cause. And a kind of jealousy that always festers underneath because somebody's getting it easier or doing it better than we are. So we're invited actually in this story into a place of rest, a recentering of our life on the most important truth of all, the essence of what it means to be a Christian is to know that your sins are forgiven through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Everything else is like way down the line in comparison to that. And out of that, learning how to think and live in a way that reflects that lens, that perspective, that utter importance of it in our relationships, the way we view ourselves and other people. So the call to us, take courage, your sins are forgiven. And to live life with that call, because that is the only place of peace. Amen.